are gonna love this interview. Just got done editing it. I'm glad I got it live for you. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes hanging out, answering any questions you have. In fact, leave a comment below about data points or what you think is gonna happen to the company and I will respond to every comment. Additionally, if you're just loving the content, click the thumbs up and I will go and check out your profile as well and give your videos some love as well. In the meantime, enjoy the interview. Hello everyone, my guest today is Prasanna Sankar. He's building a very cool company called Rippling, which is playing in the all-in-one HR and IT space. He is the CTO. All right, Prasanna, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah. All right. Um, so talk to us, you know, you come from the director of engineering role at Zenefits. So let's pick up there. When did you leave Zenefits? So I left right after Parker left. So, you know, when Parker was fired from Zenefits, I wrote him an email saying, hey, dude, like, you know, I'm, I know you're going to start a company and I want to join you. And Parker was like, no, no, I'm going to, you know, I'm done. <laughs> um, so that's sort of what kicked off, you know, the, the rippling thing. Um, after a month, he was like, yeah, actually, I'm starting a company. So <laughs> when what what company was that? Rippling. That oh, got it. Rippling. Got it. Very good. So you guys are now working. You're, you're cranking together still today. He's still active at the company. Yes. Very yeah, good. He's a CEO. So so walk us. So how did you guys get connected? So you were because you you kind of came from a competitive background. You were number one uh, in India on top code from a competitive programming perspective. Now, how do you measure competitive programming? <laughs> Is it number of code like lines written per minute or what? Um, there are a bunch of online competitive, you know, contests that run. Um, Top Coder is one. Google Code Jam is one. Um, there is Facebook runs some of those as well. Um, and they have these algorithmic problems that you need to solve in a short period of time. And, you know, they have a way to rank people. So in, in those contests, they will rank one in India consistently for a while. Yep. Okay. So I love this. So you get to get, so Parker says, Hey, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a break. He lasts barely a year and he calls you up and goes, all right, Prasanna, barely a month, barely a month. <laughs> <laughs> barely a month. He says, Prasanna, I'm jumping back in. So what year was that? When did you guys write the first line of code for this? Uh, 2016. Okay. 2016. And then when did you have your first dollar of revenue? Do you remember? Quite a bit late. I think 18 months out. 18 months. Okay, got it. So you spent 18 months essentially building the product. Listen, one of the things I always like to understand is how people approach building an MVP. Some people raise a ton and spend a ton without the first dollar revenue. Some people bootstrap to the first dollar. So how much did you guys spend on the MVP? $10 million. Okay, got it. Why? We, what we what made it so category. expensive? Um, It's just a large, large build out. I mean, imagine if Google sort of self-destructed and went under and, you know, bust went bust. There is a huge gap and wide in the market that, that it leaves. Um, so, you know, it involved uh, building, you know, what Zenefits would have built 10 years ahead. So, you know, we had to build a large product to just even get started. Mm -hmm. And what was your thesis in building the MVP? What mousetrap were you building that you thought no one else had? We clearly knew, uh, you know, Parker clearly has seen with like $50 million worth of ARR, um, the needs of customers. And, you know, they were asking for stuff that Zenefits did not have the bandwidth to build at all. You know, remember, Zenefits was growing insanely fast. Um, so, you know, we were completely focused on just servicing the existing products. And, you know, on day one, we had a clear roadmap of what the market really wanted. And who were you? So the product that you guys are building in the MVP end today, describe the customer you're selling to, your kind of sweet spot target customer. Our sweet spot customer is... 500 employees in their company, especially the ones that are growing fast, um, which have a lot of changes that are constantly happening in the company that needs to be synced in all these business systems they're using. So, you know, 500 companies fast growing. And give me a sense of what they would pay. So on average, what's, what's the ARPU of customers paying you? We are around, I think, 20, 15 to 20K. Per year? Year, yeah. Okay, got it. So this is caught fifteen hundred to kind of eighteen hundred dollar per month kind of deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And what are they deploying? I mean, as the engineer, especially the one that helped build or really built the MVP, you always like to see like, okay, we got a customer. What's the first thing that they use? Did anything surprise you in terms of what you thought they would use versus what they're actually using? Um, I mean, I've been into several startups so far. Uh, this one has been the least surprising. This one has been, you know the clearest roadmap that we've ever gotten. Uh, we did have some surprises, like, you know, uh, we did have to make some changes. Um, 
uh, especially we thought we could sort of like get away without building the health insurance part. Uh, but, you know, the competition was so intense that we had to sort of build it. Um, you know, every other player in the market was offering it. So we had to build it. So it took a bit of time to catch up to that. But like largely it's been without surprises. Um, you know, Parker sort of sat on day one and gave a four year, six year roadmap. And, you know, we've largely been executing to that. And, you know, most startups can't really say that. I, I've never been able to say that in any of my other startups. Yep. And how much capital did you guys raise on day one back in 2016? Um, day one, Parker put in, you know, half a million of his own money. Um, and beyond that, maybe in nine months, we sort of raised around $10 million. Which is what you spent on the MVP. Yeah, a little more than 10. Yeah. Yeah. And today, how much have you raised total? Total, maybe like, uh, you know, 60 million or or Six, a bit more than that. 60 million? 65. 65. 65. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you know, there are two kinds of people and I know there are very few founders that have done both. There are a lot of founders that have bootstrapped a company to call, not a lot, but I know founders that have bootstrapped to call it 30, 40, 50 million bucks in ARR. And there's others that just, you know, they're young, they're hustlers, they want a lot of risk. So they say, you know what, we're going to go the VC route. We're going to swing for the billion dollar fences. It's billion dollars or bust. I kind of put you in that category. Is it accurate? It's a hundred billion or bust. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A hundred X more aggressive than what I just said. So I like that. So how does your mind work on a daily basis to kind of, kind of rationalize that that's what you're doing? Um, I think, you know, it, it's a totally different ball game. It involves, you know, hiring the best that you can hire. It involves understanding that, you know, people and the org needs to scale, keep scaling. And, uh, you know, building technologies instead of people to do most functions, which is what we sort of like learned a lot from Zenefits. So it's failures. How much, um, how much of that upside, you know, when Parker and you, you know, get back together in 2016, there's a conversation obviously about equity uh, and equity splits relative to salary and upside and all that stuff. And obviously you have VCs on the cap table as well at this point. Did you guys just do it easy? Did you split it 50, 50 and then just take the dilution from VCs and go from there? Not really. Parker, uh, is owns more equity than I do. We okay. split it 60, 40. Okay. That's good. So 60, 40, and then 10 million from VCs early on, obviously dilutes you a little bit, but there's still enough upside for you where you're happy to go on podcasts and say, we're going for a hundred billion or bus. Cause if that happens, you're a billionaire. Yeah. 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 Very good. Um, <laughs> okay. Ba- let's go back. I-, I always like to get that from a mindset perspective because it's a very different mindset to do what you're doing versus bootstrap to, you know, 10, 20 million bucks and get rich off cash flow. Right. There's not a right or yeah. wrong. They're just different. Yeah. So it's different. you launch in 2016. It's also a function of the market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well tell me, to go deeper there since, since you went there. So what are you seeing in the market that tells you you can build a $100 billion company in this kind of all-in-one HR space? Yeah, I mean, you know, Zenefits grew from zero to $50 million in like less than two years um, in ARR. And you only sort of get that kind of growth by just like skimming the cream of the cream of the cream of the market, right? Like, you know, it, you know, it clearly signals insane market pull and huge demand for the product. And it clearly signals, you know, potentially a hundred billion dollar company uh, that could get created. And if you look at all the huge companies that got created, they had these kind of trajectories of growth rates and market pull, which is what we're seeing. So, you know, it was very clear that, you know, this is a huge market with the winner take all dynamics, you know, especially, um, you know, the ultimate play is like, um, uh, an app store where any SaaS developer can sort of plug in uh, plug in and publish his app and, uh, you know, rippling provision seats uh, and licenses on top of this, uh, on you know, and provides distribution for these apps, right? So it's, it is clearly a network effects business. It's a winner-take-all business. So, you know, it requires to be number one. Make, you know, it requires you to go for the number one. So as you're going for that number one spot, there's a lot of people that would argue and say, whoever can pay the most for the customer because their economic, you know, economics are strong, will win the customer. So you raise a lot of capital. You have a war chest. Your average first year ACV is, you said, between fifteen and 20000 bucks. What do you spend on fully weighted CAC to get that customer? We, um, we almost sort of like, um, our payback is like, you know, is insanely profitable right now. It's like one to two months or something like that. So you know, uh, it's not, it's not true. That's not the game that we're playing. You know, so yeah, I was gonna say, that means you're spending two or three grand to get a 15, $20,000 a year customer. Um, actually that's probably not true. It's our sales rep comp that we sort of recoup on the first month. Uh, so our total payback might be like, you know, nine months or something like that. So yeah. Um, 
um so we are not in the business of like paying the most to get the customer um at all um we are you know we are pretty unique nobody else has like what we have in terms of product breadth um you know um there is no competition in the market that, you know there is no one else out there going to the customers with the sales pitch that we are going with which is like we are an all in one solution uh, we are an operating system to run your company um so you know we are pretty differentiated on that well there's a lot to be fair there are a lot of companies where the prize is the same 100 billion dollar hr tech kind of store company but the mouse trap they're using to get there is different so they today would not describe themselves as all in one they would say we do this specific thing very well and they're getting a lot of traction there and they will expand to become all in one why have you chosen to basically say fuck it we're just going to say we're the all in one thing we're not going to say we're a mouse trap and we're the best at this one thing we're just say we're the best for all of it it's usually easier to get there that way um um what we've seen you know from zenefits and you know in any of the other hyper growth companies that i've been at um is once you get insane level of traction and market pull um you know things are compounding at a really huge rate that you're just like struggling to keep up with the existing product breaking and you're just like constantly patching and fixing that and you know my hypothesis is that you know if you need to create a large hyper growth company whatever you built in the first like 18 months or something is sort of the extent to which you're going to build in the life cycle of your company and we've seen that at zenefits uh, where we unsuccessfully tried to enter into new markets and you know uh, failed continually mm mm-hmm. well okay so let's we'll go back to that in a second but so for rippling between 2016 to 2017 you know you spend 10 million bucks mvp your first dollar revenue in 2017 how many customers have you scaled to now today we have around uh, you know 2000 or more than that customers you okay. know 2000 2000 somewhere and how do you how do you define a customer um someone who pays okay but is it in other words is that 2000 companies that pay you or that's the number of seats per a smaller number no. of companies it's 2000 companies that pay us i see okay and about how many seats is that i'm not sure um okay. our um i think our average customer would probably have uh 30 employees but i'm not I, you know i could be totally wrong in the ball yeah, um, yeah, yeah we've we've been sort of attracting larger and larger companies as time goes by so you know uh my estimate could be really off yep 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 well i mean look if we take 2000 customers times that acv target you told me earlier that would put you at about 3 million dollars a month right now in terms of run rate is that ballpark accurate um I don't think that's accurate. There okay. is something missing in that math, but you know, I don't think that's accurate. Which of those two numbers is off? So you said earlier twenty thousand dollar ACV, and you just said two thousand customers. Those multiplied would put you at a three million run rate. Um, Or MRR. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I don't want to get into the revenue numbers yet. You know, because of the backlash. Uh, you know, we're sort of like pretty coy about the revenue numbers because you know, Zenefits had a lot of coverage around that and. you know it sort of anchors us out there um so we're sort of like not really talking about the revenue numbers but you know i can tell you that it is sort of the fastest growing company that i've kind of like seen you know we've keep, kept it under the radar um you know it's uh, it's sort of like at slack kind of growth rates well persona so just to be clear i get people that come on all the time that raise a lot of capital they're burning like you wouldn't believe they say they're the fastest growing and when you try and get quantification they go oh, oh, oh I, I, we're not we're not talking about it and usually it's bullshit right so when i'm looking at when i'm looking i never want to bring out a revenue number unless the guest in this case you provides the data for me to get to that number so you know we have a very sophisticated saas audience very smart people listen 10 million downloads they will take 2000 customers times an arpu to get MRR. That's how the math works. So, I just want to give you 1 second to potentially correct either of those numbers because that's what's going to happen. They're going to multiply that ACV you said times 2000 customers and back into 3 million a month in revenue. What I would say is all these numbers are shifting really fast. You know, the ACV is growing really fast. No, but we um, we it, talked about ARPU though. ARPU is average revenue per user per month. So is what you're saying basically but by the way we can I'll move on from this if you can just I just want to quantify this to put an end on this part of the story right what yeah. I hear you saying is you're moving upstream which means your new ACV today might be $20,000 ACVs but you might have historical cohorts that paid less than that so you can't just multiply 20,000 times 2,000 customers to get a $36 million run rate today 
That's correct. I see. Okay, cool. I think that's a good, I think that's a good kind of close off to that story. So the lessons there is you start off with, again, cheaper, potentially lesser value cohorts, smaller team sizes. Then now the average team is 30 people, $20,000 ACVs, you're scaling uh, and go, and today you have 2000 paying customers. Yeah. Now is a $30 million run rate, you know, in your sites in the next 12 to 24 months, or do you think you need more time to get there? Um, I'm going to decline on that one. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't want to answer that one. Okay. Uh, Why do you decline that? But then uh, two minutes prior, you say we're the fastest growing company. It's hyper scale. It's hyper growth. It's the best we've ever seen. It, it seems those are at very opposite ends of the spectrum. We don't want to talk about, you know, revenue numbers and anchors out there. Um, but, you know, I can tell you that, like, you know, I've, it's sort of like kind of, you know, at the space at which the company is growing, I've never seen it's incredible. So I can tell you that. Um, yeah, but going from a dollar a year to a thousand dollars a year in revenue is incredible growth rate. It means nothing. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you you understand. I'm asking these questions so that to try and help you fill out the story, and so that it's so it's less vague, not more vague. That's the only reason I'm I'm continuing to ask you these questions. So you can keep saying best growth all you want, but my audience again, they're smart. They're going to listen to that and go something's fishy here. I just want to give you any, any opening you want to clarify anything. Um, um, you know, I think, you know, $36 million in ARR is not really far away. Mm -hmm. Fair. Okay. That's a good end. That's a good end to that part of the story. So let's move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's good. Um, where are you getting most of the growth? So, so Zenefit's famously got into all kinds of hot water because of Really, it was the market motion. Do you work with the providers? Do you not like? Are you a broker? Are you not a broker? So, what's the go-to-market strategy for Rippling? Um, we so Rippling is an all-in-one uh, product, right? So we have a payroll system, we have an insurance product, we have the HR product, and so on. So um, we use all these different channels to distribute the product today. Um, so you know, we could go and sell to accountants, we could go and sell through insurance brokers, and we could go and sell through you know IT admins. Um, and we use, we typically use all of them to our advantage, um, which gives us some level of virality as well. So you just, know, you can, just to be, yeah. I mean, maybe let me go back to the roots then the first hundred customers you signed up, how did you sign? What channel did you mainly rely on to get the first hundred email? Mostly oh, email. Okay. Tell me more about that. Like cold outreach, cold outreach. Yep. Wow. Okay. What, I mean, how did you find their email and what job title were you targeting? We were targeting at that point in the beginning, it was like founders, um, you know, CEO, CTO. Um, it is mostly that. Um, and then as we sort of continue to grow and scale and expand, uh, you know, we went into the HR job title, the IT admins and so on. Okay. Very good. Now, again, you've raised 65 million bucks. Uh, I imagine you guys are actively growing the team. What's the team size today? It's around 200 people. How many engineers do you manage? hundred people. Wow. Okay. hundred engineers. Now, do you have quota carrying reps internally for an inside sales motion or it's all channel partners? We, we do have quota carrying reps. How many of those? Um, I think maybe like 20 people today. Okay. Okay. Very good. Now are these, are they following the same kind of inside sales playbook as you might've seen at Zenefits as well, or is it totally different? It's very similar playbook. Um, yeah, it's, it's not very different. Okay. So similar playbook, by the way, I would define as, you know, quota target is about five times what full OTE is. Uh, you have an SDR to account executive to customer success management kind of flow. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And then look, obviously building a big SaaS company, churn is critical. It can absolutely destroy you. So when you look at your gross revenue churn over the past 12 months, what's that coming at? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I, I don't know. We look at churn all the time. Um, the churn is seasonally high towards the end of the year in our business. Um, and it sort of varies, it fluctuates a lot. Um, um, yeah, I'm not really sure like where it stands today. Do you know if when you add your expansion revenue from a historical cohorts back to the churn from those cohorts, is net revenue retention greater than 100%? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is significantly greater than 100%. When we raised our last financing round uh, from Kleiner, it was around 300%, which was something you know abnormal. Um, that was mostly because, you know, we were especially selling to fast growing companies. So, you know, they grow, 
Um, so it was abnormally high. Now, as we sort of get a larger portion of the market, it is, you know, it is less impressive, but it's still pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. Getting that kind of a net revenue rate, the re- way you do that is exactly how you just described. But to your point, as you scale, right, even a 140%, 150% net revenue retention number is world class. You know, Looker was 130% when Frank came on the show a year before the Google acquisition. So anywhere in that range is obviously super healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Most of that upselling is coming directly from seat upsells, or are you upselling based off some utility metric or a feature-based upsell? Most of it has been seat upsells, which is automatic, right? Like we don't even put, you know, we have not done historically a great job on upsells so far. You know, right now we're sort of investing more on that, but most of it is just like organic seat ads. Very good. Okay, and so when was the Kleiner raise, the most recent raise? It was uh, Feb last year, so around like a year ago. Okay, and how much was it for? Uh, it was like uh, um, 45 million. Uh, okay, 45. And so how were, when you and Parker got together and whoever else is on your strategy team and said, hey, we're gonna go do a fundraise. Take, you know, let's go macro here for a second, the, the world economy today. As a SaaS company that's scaling, how many months of runway are you trying to raise for just to give yourself enough cushion? We were trying uh, to raise for like 30 months at the time. And and help me, you know, why is that? You know, in the past, you know, three years ago when I was interviewing founders, it might've been sounded more like 18 months because remember the more you raise, the more dilution it is, right? So why was 30 months kind of the target? Parker has been, you know, uh, pretty conservative on this stuff. Like, you know, you can, you know, if you can either get diluted a bit more or, you know, can run out of money. So, um, you know, we've always chosen. Or you can, or you can drive towards profitability. You can, you definitely can. Um, you know, every round that we raise, we sort of like have the goal that, you know, that round gets us to profitability. Um, and then, you know, there is a plan A that the opportunity in front is just like huge and you press the accelerator button the, where the return on investment is clearly visible and then you raise raise again. Yep. So just to be clear, when you raise the 45 million trying to cover 30 months of burn, what I hear when you say that is you guys are totally comfortable when you look at the market and how big it is you're going after burning up to $1.5 million per month for the next 30 months. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Anything else I missed that you definitely want to sneak in before we wrap up? Um, No. Great. Thanks for (laughs) chatting. (laughs) All right. Let's wrap up here with some easy ones. Famous five. Number one, favorite business book. Um. Hard thing about hard things. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Um, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> number Very three. Close. Yeah, number three. What's your favorite online tool for building the company? Um, Asana. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Eight. Okay, and what's your situation? Married, single kiddos? Um, single kid. Okay, good. Single with one kid, and uh, how old are you? I'm 32. Okay, last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Um, that uh, I enjoy finance as well. <laughs> you enjoy, wait, we didn't touch on that at all in the interview. Why, why do you enjoy finance? Um, I think, you know, uh, the two things I really enjoy are like coding and trading. Um, both of them um, require no, you know, you could be the expert, you know, like, experts uh, don't really exist you know they operate on very simple rules uh, buy low sell high or you know um, you know write some add uh, subtract go to um, and uh, you know experts don't really matter you can reason from first principles guys there you have it prasanna and parker left zenefits about the same time back in 2015 2016 they then jumped into the new company rippling together raised 10 million bucks right away parker put in about 500 grand they split equity 60 percent to parker 40 percent to prasanna they're now scaling nicely trying to be the all-in-one hr and it tech platform currently serving 2,000 customers uh prasanna says 36 million bucks in terms of run rate is not too distant in the future we'll see how that pans out but they're again scaling through all kinds of channels whether it's resellers uh or their 20 account executives. They've got a team today of about 300, or sorry, 200 people, a hundred of which are engineers, $65 million total raise net revenue retention of over 300% spending about 10,000 bucks to get a new customer for call it a seven to 14 month payback period. Prasanna, thank you for taking us to the top. Thank you so much, Nathan.
As you guys know, I fight like heck to get these data points for you from these CEOs that rarely do these kinds of shows. If you want more shows like this, make sure you subscribe right now. We're trying to get 10,000 YouTube subscribers by the end of September here, 2019, and it would mean the world to me if you clicked now to subscribe. Additionally, I've got two more great interviews for you. If you want more data points from the world's leading SaaS CEOs, click and watch one of them right now.